Hello, I'm Dana Sparks, Director of the Georgia Real Estate Academy, and welcome to License Law for Agents and Brokers, Great Course Number 65208. Today we are going to talk about the uh, license law that you as a real estate agent are held to by virtue of your license. As a reference, today's license law is the actual Georgia Code, Title, Title 43, Chapter 40, and in conjunction with the GREC Rules 520-01. Please see the GREC website for the specific laws and rules, as well as the handouts that go along with this presentation. The text on the following slides may have been abbreviated or paraphrased from license law or the GREC rules text. All licensees are individually responsible for reading, understanding, and following Georgia Real Estate License Law as it is written in the Georgia Code and the GREC rules. So what is Georgia Real Estate Commission, the Real Estate Commission, what is their purpose, and what is the license law and the GREC related rules? Well, Georgia's purpose, Georgia's, the Real Estate Commission's purpose is basically to administer license law. Their purpose is to hold you as the agent, as a salesperson or broker or community association manager accountable to the license law that you agreed to abide by when you did get your real estate license. As a regulatory body, the role of the commission is not to protect the industry or the profession that it regulates, nor to protect consumers. It is not the role of regulators to be advocates for either a profession or a consumer. Instead, the role of the regulators is to protect the public interest. Basically, protecting that public interest means assuring that every individual's right to justice and equal opportunity. Regulators protect the public interest when they deny the right to practice to the incompetent and unscrupulous. Regulators protect the public interest when they eliminate barriers that unreasonably limit entry into a field of practice. Regulators protect the public interest when they refuse to use licensing or registration laws to settle private disputes. Regulators protect the public interest when they refuse to use licensing or registration laws to advance the interest of a private trade association. Regulators protect the public interest when they encourage free and open markets. Therefore, the public interest demands that regulators use their best efforts to achieve impartiality. So GREC is a, pub a public regulator, and basically what GREC's role is, is to protect the public from real estate agents, rather from unscrupulous or incompetent real estate agents. That is why it is your responsibility as a licensee to understand what the license laws and GREC rules are. Actual license law and GREC rules, again, you can find them on the GREC website. If you just go to Google and Google GREC, you will get the GREC website, and then you put in the search bar Georgia License Law and Related Laws and Rules. And the Georgia License Law is Title 43, Chapter 40. And these are the actual other related laws. Title 10, Brokerage Relationships. Title 16, Title 43, Title 44, Title 48. And the GREC rules and regulations that support the license law R520-1, dash 2, dash 4, and dash 5. There is a comparison guide to the reorganized rules in Chapter 520-1 when you link on this site. So for review, this CE class is going to cover the main tenets of license law and the GREC rules. These are the effects of prohibited conduct on your license, 
requirements for transfer to another firm, requirements for handling escrow funds, unfair trade practices prohibited in Georgia, broker relationships and handling transactions, management responsibilities of real estate firms, advertising rules, and licensees acting as principals. Again, you are responsible for understanding and knowing all of the license laws and GREC rules, but these are the main areas that we are going to cover today. So let's start with the quiz. Don't worry, you're not going to be graded on the quiz. This is just a starting point for you to determine your current level of knowledge of license law and the rules. So, here is the quiz. Take your time and answer these questions, true or false. I can name the seven federally protected classes of the Fair Housing Act. Hopefully you mark true, but we'll see as we go through. Your original real estate license wall certificate must be held by your broker. Licensees who have moved from one firm to another are entitled to continue working on pending sales from their old firm. Agents who own rental property may hold security deposits in their own business bank account. A broker may never pay a commission to a non-licensed person or entity. Licensees shall place earnest money into the custody of their broker within three business days. A broker who disperses earnest money contrary to the terms of a contract can be deemed incompetent by the commission. Agents are allowed to collect commissions and or fees from someone other than their broker at any time. Failure to include a specific expiration date in a listing agreement is considered an unfair trade practice. Fees being paid for referrals must be disclosed in writing to the principal when he or she is being referred for real estate services or relocation. Acting for more than one party in a transaction without the express written consent of all parties is considered an unfair trade practice. Agents must provide a copy of any document utilized in a real estate transaction to any individual signing such document. An agent may rebate a portion of their commission to a client or customer after the sale closes. An agent's assistant may do anything an agent is allowed to do as long as the agent and their broker supervise that activity. All advertising by licensees must be done under the direct supervision of their broker and in the name of their firm. Take a few minutes and go through and mark your answers true or false. We are going to address all of these issues as we go throughout the class. All right, let's see how you did. Here are the answers. Hopefully you marked true that you can name the seven federally protected classes of the Fair Housing Act, but we'll see, we'll address that in just a moment. Your original real estate wall license must be held by your broker, that is true. Licensees who have moved from one firm to another are entitled to continue working on pending sales from their old firm. That is false. Actually, that's true. Pending certain things are in place. But in and of itself, it is false. Agents who own rental property may hold security deposits in their own business bank account. Absolutely false. A broker may never pay a commission to a non-licensed person or entity. False. Did I get you? Licensees shall place earnest money into the custody of their broker within three business days. That is false, false, false. The correct answer, and we will address this throughout the class, is as soon as practically possible. 
A broker who disperses earnest money, contrary to the terms of a contract, can be deemed to be incompetent by the commission. That is absolutely true. Agents are allowed to collect commissions and or fees from someone other than their broker at any time. Absolutely false. You as a licensee can only get paid by the broker holding your license unless there is an agreement in writing. And we'll cover that as we go throughout the class. Failure to in include a specific expiration date in a listing agreement is absolutely considered an unfair trade practice. That is true. Fees being paid for referrals must be disclosed in writing to the principal when he or she is being referred for real estate services or relocation. That is true. So the question is, are you doing that? I think most of you are absolutely signing a broker-to-broker -broker referral with another brokerage so that you get paid, but are you getting the person whom you are referring? Are you getting their signature, agreeing to that in writing? That's a license law tenant to which you must uh, uh, agree to and must uh, perform. Acting for more than one party in a transaction without the express written consent of all parties is considered an unfair trade practice, true. Agents must provide a copy of any document utilized in a real estate transaction to any individual signing such document, true. An agent may rebate a portion of their commission to a client or customer after the sale closes, absolutely false. You may not give back any part of your commission or any, part, any rebate to a client after the sale closes. An agent's assistant may do anything an agent is allowed to do as long as the agent and their broker supervise that activity. That is false. All advertising by licensees must be done under the direct supervision of their broker and in the name of their firm. That is true. So how'd you do? Hopefully you did well, and again, we're going to cover these issues as we go throughout the class. So let's start off with the effects of prohibited conduct. Fair housing violations. If you are found guilty of a violation of Georgia or federal fair housing law, such conviction may be sufficient grounds for refusal of the license if you haven't gotten your license yet, or imposition of any sanction permitted by this chapter. I'm going to start off with a couple of YouTube videos. Available online. 
just Google prohibited HUD advertising words, and you'll get several to choose from. The thing is, if a plaintiff is successful on an FHA claim against a broker, the judgment can include not only actual damages, but punitive damages and attorney fees and costs incurred by the plaintiff, so it can be a costly error. When in doubt about whether a particular term or phrase is a violation of the law, just don't do it. Don't publish the potentially offensive remarks. So not to confuse you, but single-family home is an acceptable description of a property. But family home in best areas would cross the line. Cozy family room works, but perfect for the growing family puts you in dangerous territory. And close to jogging trails would be acceptable, but perfect for joggers would be a problem. Just remember to describe the property and not the potential occupants, and you'll be on the right track. As real force, we are available to help guide consumers through all types of real estate transactions and to help everyone find a home that meets their needs. And as real force, we are subject to the additional standards of total non-discrimination that is part of the real force code of ethics, Article 10. Violation of the code leads to disciplinary action against the real force, in addition to the penalties under applicable laws. Next time, we're going to talk about some best practices for a demonstration of our commitment to fair housing. What did you think? Did any of that surprise you? Hmm. Let's watch one more. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Can I ask a few questions about the apartment on Park Street? What was your name? My name. Uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. Fernandez. Who is John? Hello. My name is Sanjay Kumar. I am talking about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available. Hello. My name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. Fernandez. Hello. I am Chen Li. My name is Khalid Ben Ali. I'm Juan Bo. Hello. My name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. It's gone. Not available. All right. Thank you. Yes. Hello. My name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yes. Really? Housing discrimination is illegal. If you think you've been a victim because of your race, color, national origin, sex, religion, disability, or family status, call us. Fair housing. It's not an option. It's the law. videos just to illustrate the point of fair housing. Does it surprise you to know that there is not an actual list of HUD prohibited words? Did some of those samples surprise you like uh, near jogging trails versus perfect for joggers? If you work with rentals or if you screen applicants, you have better know uh, federal fair housing laws. Also, does your landlord client discriminate? Fair housing laws are federal laws that apply not only to you as a licensee, but to anybody, because it is a law of the land, so to speak. Let's go over some of these words. The it's very uh, interesting, and again, if you just Google what she said to Google in the uh, video, you will get some of these handouts. This is from the Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity Fair Housing Advertising Word and Phrase Usage List. And again, this list is just designed to assist you in complying with federal fair housing laws. Words which you at, which absolutely violate the law and you absolutely may not use. Things, any type of ethnic references, references to nationality, anything such as able-bodied, adult building, adult living, agile, African, Anglo-Saxon, Asian, couple, crippled, uh, any specific nationality or religion, those are an absolute no-no. 
These words or phrases may violate the law, totally depends on the context within which they are used. For example, executive, females only, fisherman's retreat, gender, man only, mature, private, synagogue. These words on this column absolutely are very much unlikely to violate the law. Accessible, den, desirable neighborhood, no drinking, no drugs, uh, great view, so forth and so on. Let's look at a couple of other handouts. Here's some more fair housing advertising words. These are some words to avoid, use with caution, and acceptable. Again, the best thing to remember is describe the property, not the people. So you can say near the Silver Comet Trail, but you cannot say perfect for the person, perfect for people who love to jog or ride their bikes on the Silver Comet Trail. And here is one more list. Again, bold words are not acceptable. Italic words used with caution. Standard uh, font are acceptable. Please keep this handout and consult it when you are doing any marketing, whether that be on a, uh, a flyer that you're using in any of the MLS remarks or any type of advertising that you're doing online or anywhere. Does this symbol appear on all your marketing, this equal housing opportunity symbol? It's not required. It's just an outward sign that you provide equal housing opportunities. It is required, however, if you are advertising a HUD home, uh, which you can advertise. There are specific rules to market a HUD property, but you have to look at HUDHomestore.com and HUD.gov for those specific advertising rules, but you absolutely must use this equal housing opportunity symbol on any marketing of HUD properties. Okay, here's a bonus question for you. What about sexual orientation? Is that a protected class? It is your responsibility to know, in general, what are protected classes or what would violate fair housing laws. It is also up to you to educate your clients with the HUD pamphlet. You need to know the seven federally protected classes. So again, what do you think? Is sexual orientation a federally protected class? Well, let's take a look. The answer is federal law, at least as of right now, this is November 2015, federal law does not protect people against housing discrimination based on their sexual orientation. However, the District of Columbia, several cities and towns, and the following states do include sexual orientation as a protected class in their housing discrimination laws. California, Colorado, Connecticut, Hawaii, so forth. Georgia is currently not on this list. Again, this is November 2015. Do we think these laws will change? More than likely, they will change statewide, and they will more than likely change federally. But as of right now, again, there are state laws as well as federal laws, and sexual orientation is not a protected class federally at the current moment. So let's cover the seven federally protected classes. Just remember fresh corn. That's the easiest way to remember what is protected federally under fair housing. F is familial status, R is religion, E doesn't stand for anything right now, S is for sex, H handicap status or disability, C is color, O doesn't stand for anything, R is race, and N is national origin. So again, there's no E or O, so it's easy to remember equal opportunity. Oh, get it? So fresh corn, fresh corn. Easiest way to remember the federally protected classes. All right, back to prohibited conduct. Again, according to the Georgia Code Law uh, 4340.15b, false statement on an application 
where an applicant or licensee has made a false statement of material fact on their application, such action may be sufficient grounds for a refusal, suspension, or revocation of a license. Just parenthetically, all of these license laws and rules that we're going to go over, they apply to you as a licensee, or they apply to you if you are getting ready to get a real estate license, or if your license has lapsed and you're going to reapply for a license. Grounds for suspension or revocation of the license shall also be grounds for refusal to grant a license. Grounds for denial of a license shall also be grounds for imposition of any sanction. So they go hand in hand, and it is up to the Real Estate Commission to choose what they are going to do based on their findings as well as based on if you currently have a license or are in the process of getting a license. When GREC initiates an investigation to determine if a licensee is guilty of prohibited conduct and such licensee has surrendered or let their license lapse, GREC may issue an order revoking that license. The order to revoke shall be effective 10 days after the order is served unless you make a written request for a hearing from GREC. When a Georgia occupational licensing body or the licensing body of any other state has disciplined the license of an applicant or whenever such an application has allowed a license to lapse or has surrendered a license after initiating an investigation or a disciplinary process regarding such applicant's license, such discipline, lapsing, or surrender in itself may be sufficient grounds of refusal of a license. What that means, if you have a license issued by a state, whether it be the state of Georgia or any other state, or any other occupation, if anything has happened to your license in that other profession, it is also grounds for the Real Estate Commission. It could potentially affect your real estate license. So what are some other licensing uh, occupations where you get a license from the state? Hmm. Something such as nursing, you have to get a, a license issued by the state for nursing. Teaching, many times you have to get a teacher's license issued by the state. Um, an insurance license, a trading license if you're a stockbroker. So if, if you have a license in any other type of occupation, whether it be from Georgia or another state, again, if anything has if your license has been investigated or jeopardized, any other state-issued license, you need to notify GREC because it is also potentially going to affect your real estate license. If you've been revoked, GREC may reissue an associate broker's or broker's license only if these three conditions exist. Ten years have passed since your license was revoked. There are no pending criminal charges against you and you provide proof to the Real Estate Commission that you now bear a good reputation for honesty, trustworthiness, integrity, and competence so that you can transact business of a licensee in such manner as to safeguard the public interest. Remember, Greg's sole purpose is to protect the public against real estate agents. When you've been convicted of any offense named in the subsection B of this code section, uh, which is defined as any felony or crime of moral turpitude, the licensee shall immediately notify GREC of that conviction. Your license will automatically be revoked for 60 days after the conviction unless you make a written request to GREC for a hearing. Following the hearing, GREC, in its discretion, may impose upon the licensee, you, any sanction permitted by this chapter. When GREC revokes or suspends a licensee's license, then any school or instructor approval that you hold shall also be revoked or suspended. When a licensee surrenders a real estate license, any school or instructor approval that you hold shall be subject to revocation. So basically what that means, if you are a licensee and you're also an instructor in a school or the director of a school, and if something happens to your, uh, to your salesperson or broker's license or associate broker's license, it affects every capacity in which you are interacting with the public real estate related, whether that be instructing or transacting transactions. Another prohibited conduct is where an applicant or licensee has been found not in compliance for an order with child support, as provided in the code section 19-28.1 or 19-11-9.3. 
such action shall be sufficient grounds for refusal of a license or suspension of a license. So if you are in uh, not in compliance with a child support order, your real estate license is in potential jeopardy. Another prohibited conduct for you as a licensee is where an applicant or licensee has been found to be a borrower in default who is not in satisfactory repayment status as provided in Code Section 20-3-295. Such status shall be sufficient grounds for refusal of a license or suspension of a license. So borrower in default, what does that mean? Well, don't worry. <laughs> it doesn't mean if you have defaulted on your mortgage payment. What it means if you are a borrower in default for a student loan. So the code section that this license law refers to is the Georgia Higher Education Assistance Loan Program. So if you're in default of your student loan, then your real estate license is in potential jeopardy. In such cases, the hearing and appeal procedures provided for in that code section shall be the only such procedures required under this chapter. Where the Real Estate Commission has previously sanctioned an applicant for a license, such sanction may in itself be a sufficient ground for refusing the license. So those are the effects of prohibited conduct on your license, whether you have a license or you are thinking about getting a license. So now let's cover requirements to transfer to another firm. This is all having to do with changes or transfers. You as a licensee want to transfer to another firm. When a broker changes the, or a broker's changing anything. When a broker changes the address of their place of business, the broker shall notify Greg in writing within 30 days of such a change. Remember, if you as a licensee, if your address changes, or your primary email address changes, you must also notify the Real Estate Commission. You can do this on their website or on the GREC change form. Basically, if all you have to do is keep in mind that GREC, as the governing body that holds your license, they have to be able to have a way to get in touch with you, either by a mailing address to be able to mail you something officially, or to be able to contact you by email. So let's look at the form where you would change uh, some information with Greg and notify them. Again, you can do it on their website or you can use what's called the Greg or the Georgia Real Estate Commission change application. This is the form that you're going to use to change anything. Uh, this has your name on there. This is if you are going to change your email address, your residence address, your mailing address, your name. This is also if you are going to uh, go inactive, activate your license, or transfer your license. These are for, uh, these questions right here for you to fill out if you hold a broker or an associate broker's license. This is what you're going to fill out if you want to be released from a firm or affiliate with another firm. But again, this is the form that you're going to use even if you are just staying with the same firm, but changing your email address, your name, or your mailing address or residence address. Correct? Has to be notified. When an affiliated licensee leaves the firm, the broker shall immediately cause the license of that licensee to be forwarded either to Greg or to a new broker for whom the licensee will act. So your broker has to have a copy of your license. Remember that parchment license that you got or that your broker got when you first got licensed? The broker can either actually mail that wall license to the new broker or nowadays, actually, everything is handled electronically on the Real Estate Commission's website. If the wall certificate is forwarded to the new broker, the releasing broker shall notify Greg in writing of that action. And again, that Greg change form I just covered is how brokers notify Greg in writing. The releasing broker shall furnish such other information regarding the termination of said licensee as Greg may require. Any licensee who's released by a broker shall not engage in the activities of a real estate licensee until that licensee 
delivers to Grec a signed transfer form, or it can be done electronically, or for brokers, receives from Grec a wall certificate authorizing service as a broker or qualifying broker. So basically what that means is if you transfer between one brokerage to another firm, until the, if you get released from one firm, until that new broker actually pulls you onto their roster electronically or Greg puts you on their roster, you must cease and desist from the practice of real estate. You may not sign any contracts. You may not interact with any clients. Again, with everything being electronic and digital nowadays, your broker can release you and a new broker can pick you up electronically so that there is no downtime in your service to your clients and customers. But if, you, if a broker is not holding your license, again, you must cease and desist. So make sure somebody has your license. A licensee transferring to a new broker may continue to ask for that broker on pending sales provided both brokers agree in writing, the transactions are noted in writing, the former broker accepts full responsibility, and the written agreement shows the compensation. So basically, that was a quiz question. Can you, uh, can you work on a transaction that is not under your broker? Well, the answer is it depends if you have this form in writing. So here is the form. It is a GAR form called Agreement Between New Broker and Former Broker of a Transferring Licensee. And this form is written by GAR with license law in mind. So it is an agreement between the new broker and the former broker where it outlines the specific property address and the licensee's compensation. And it also basically says that uh, the former broker agrees to assume full responsibility for the licensee's activities regarding the following sales, uh, sale or lease transactions. Licensees transferring to a new broker may continue to act for that broker on pending sales provided, that's what we just went over. A licensee may not act on behalf of any broker other than the one holding their license except as just mentioned. So that's the quiz question. As soon as you get agreement between the two brokers, then you can work on behalf of the other broker. And also you can get paid from the other broker with, from the former broker with permission from the new broker. All right, let's continue on. A written independent contractor agreement is required for all licensees affiliated with a broker's firm. This must include the terms of compensation for both during affiliation and on transactions begun but not completed during affiliation. Disputes are not grounds for refusal to release. So what does that mean? Basically, when you are signing on with a broker, with a brokerage, with a firm, your independent contractor agreement should specifically outline your compensation while you are with that broker. And then let's say you get a transaction pending, but choose to leave and go to another firm. Well, are you going to get paid in the same manner that you got paid when you were active with that firm? That should be clearly outlined in your independent contractor agreement or in the policies of the firm. Make sure you check that. If there are any grounds, any uh, disputes regarding your compensation by a broker or any money that you potentially owe a broker, whether it be from a commission compensation or from monthly fees or dues or anything along those lines, that is not grounds for a broker to release your license. When requested, a broker must release your license. You can still settle financial disputes later, but they cannot hold your license as hostage. Basically, when a licensee requests a change form be signed, the releasing broker shall immediately sign it and forward the wall certificate. Wall certificates should be delivered as soon as practically possible to a new broker. And again, that can happen electronically through the GREC website. Your firms have access to the rosters online through GREC. Transferring licensees shall not take nor have in their possession nor use any brokerage engagement secured through the office unless authorized by the releasing broker. All property of the releasing broker shall be returned to that releasing broker. So basically, all contracts are written in your broker's name. The listing agreement is in your broker's name. 
by your brokerage agreements are in your broker's name, and contracts are in your broker's name. So basically those contracts are the actual quote unquote property of the broker. So you can't take any pending transaction, any listing, or any buyer brokerage with you to another firm unless it is released by the former broker. Wall certificates returned to the Real Estate Commission should be accompanied by a release form signed by both broker and licensee. That's that great change form that we discussed earlier. Licensees have one month to activate with another firm or notify Grex of choosing an inactive status. Before you go completely inactive, please note that a lot of firms have what's called a holding company, where you're not necessarily going to practice active real estate, but you must maintain an active license and it must be held by a broker in order for you to get paid for any type of even referral that you give to an active licensee. So you can't get paid even on a referral if you give a referral if your license is not held by a broker. So again, before you totally go inactive with Grec, make sure that you uh, find out if, a, if your broker or any broker has what's called a holding company or a referral company where you can still get paid. If a broker is releasing a licensee for reasons other than the licensee's request, and is unable for any reason to obtain the licensee's signature on that release, the broker shall then send to Grec a copy of a letter from the broker mailed to the licensee's last known address indicating that the broker is returning the license to Grec. This is, for example, if your broker chooses to release your license. Not you asking the broker to be released, but your broker decides to release you. The broker has to notify Grec and has to send a letter to you to, their la to your last known address that your broker had for you. The broker's letter to the licensee should state clearly that the licensee has one month from uh, the Real Estate Commission's receipt of your wall certificate or notification that you're being released to apply to transfer to another firm or to go ahead and go inactive with the Real Estate Commission. When a licensee decides to leave a firm, such licensee may not have any contact with any of the firm's clients that the licensee is serving until the expiration of that brokerage engagement, except as expressly approved in writing by that broker. That's what we were just discussing. While agents may sign contracts for the firm, applications for sponsoring broker forms and transfer to release forms may only be signed by the broker. So you know how you as a licensee can sign contracts that even says on their broker or affiliated licensee. What this uh, rule, Greg Rule is stating is that you as a affiliated licensee cannot sign your own sponsoring broker form or release form. It has to be done by the broker or whomever the broker has authorized to sign it. For example, staff, an agent services coordinator or an affiliated uh, an associate broker with that type of staff responsibility for the firm. Duplicate certificates of licensure and or pocket cards shall be issued upon satisfactory proof of loss of the original. Those can also be uh, uh, received online, can be printed online very easily. All right, we've covered two topics. Now let's cover requirements for handling escrow funds. This is a biggie. For this section, the term escrow account and trust account shall be used interchangeably. We'll use the term trust account in the following slides rather than trust or escrow, just to make the slide a little bit easier for you to read. All right, back to law. Georgia Code 43-40-20A. Each broker who accepts trust funds shall maintain a separate federally insured bank checking account which shall be designated as a trust account where all funds held on behalf of another person shall be deposited. The account shall not be subject to attachment or garnishment. Just a note before I continue. These laws, although it has the term broker and they do absolutely specifically apply to broker, they also will apply to you as a licensee if you are holding trust money on behalf of someone else. For example, if you uh, if your broker allows you to do property management 
and you are holding a security deposit, then all of these laws re uh, regarding handling escrow funds did apply to you as well. We'll cover a lot of these laws more specifically at the end of the presentation when we get to agents acting as principals. But just because you're not necessarily a qualifying broker of a firm, if you do have rental property, for example, this applies to you as well. So pay attention. Also, just to let you know, in July of this year, they just changed this law, and it doesn't have to be just a checking account. Uh, the law has changed that it is, as long as it is in a federally insured account, it can be a money market account, it can be a savings account, as long as it is federally insured, then Greg allows uh, a broker or you as a licensee with certain, um, certain other uh, uh, tenants have to apply, but that can also be designated as an escrow account. Again, the account shall not be subject to attachment or garnishment. Brokers shall not notify the Real Estate Commission of the name of the bank in which the trust account is maintained and also the number of the account or the name of the account if they don't have numbers. Brokers shall authorize GREC, the Real Estate Commission, to examine each trust account at any time upon reasonable cause and during each renewal period. In lieu of an examination, Greg can say, okay, we're going to examine that account, or the Real Estate Commission can accept a written report from a CPA that the broker's trust account is maintained as required. In lieu of the renewal period examination, Greg can also accept with the, uh, with the broker's renewal application in fee just a summary of the data on that account on a form approved by Greg if the data appears complete and includes no indication of irregularity. So basically, you as a broker, this is for you brokers now, when you renew your, uh, your broker's license for your firm, you can simply give the Real Estate Commission a summary of your trust account and on the form that they require, which can also be done online. And as long as there's no uh, apparent irregularity in that data, Greg can accept that, or they can choose to do an audit. A broker may maintain more than one trust account if Greg is advised of such account. A broker shall not be entitled to any part of the trust funds paid to the broker in connection with any real estate transaction as part or all of the broker's commission or fee until that transaction has actually been closed or terminated. So if money is put into an account and designated as an escrow account, in other words, somebody else's money, the broker cannot use it for commission or anything else unless that transaction has been closed or terminated. Any licensee acting in the capacity of principal in the sale of interest in real estate owned by such licensee shall deposit trust funds in the same manner and is not entitled to these funds until the sale closes. The Real Estate Commission may allow a non-resident broker to maintain a trust account in a bank of their state of residence, provided that the Real Estate Commission is authorized to examine the account and the licensee meets the requirements of any rules which GREC may establish regarding the maintenance of such accounts. Licensees who receive trust funds on property they own must deposit those funds into a trust account maintained by the broker with whom their licensees are affiliated or in a designated trust account approved by that broker. So if you as a licensee have rental property and you hold trust funds, you hold a security deposit from a tenant, it has to either go into the trust account of your broker or of a property management firm, or you can put it in a designated trust account as long as your broker allows you as a licensee to have a trust account and it has been approved by the broker and registered with GREC. If the broker approves the licensee holding funds in a trust account owned by the licensee, the broker shall assure that the account is designated as a trust and shall notify GREC of the name of the bank and the number of the account with the licensee owns. The licensee who owns such account shall maintain records on the account at same as required for brokers. Again, so it is, it is allowed by license law and the Real Estate Commission for you as a licensee to hold your own trust account. However, each firm may have a policy regarding you as a licensee holding trust money for your own rental properties. The licensee who owns such an account, so if your broker does allow you as a licensee to have a trust account to hold security deposits for tenants for your own property, 
you shall provide the licensee's broker at least quarterly a written reconciliation statement of that trust account comparing the licensee's total trust liability with the reconciled bank balance of that trust account. All right, now let's go on to handling escrow funds, part two, the actual GREC rules. Now, a lot of the GREC rules actually just more specifically define the Georgia law. There's a lot of overlap, um, and again, please remember, we're, we're talking about two different issues. We're talking about Georgia license law and the GREC rules. So there is a lot of overlap, but the GREC rules simply define a little bit further some of the laws. So some of this may appear repetitive. <clears throat> Brokers may maintain multiple trust accounts. You have to notify GREC of each within one month after opening the account. Licensees shall place all cash, checks, or other items of value received into the custody of the broker holding their license, here we go, as soon after receipt as is practically possible. Again, that was a quiz question. Three business days? No. As soon after receipt as practically possible. When acting as a principal in the sale of interest in real estate owned by the licensee, the same applies. So this means if you are selling your own house, or buying your own house, or buying or selling or interacting with your own investment property, you, the same rules apply. You shall place all cash, checks, or other items of value received into the custody of the broker holding your license as soon after receipt as practically possible. The broker holding funds shall promptly deposit those funds in their trust account and shall make appropriate arrangements for the safekeeping of uh, all other items, items of value. Again, please check with your broker. Different firms have different policies on what they will allow their licensees to accept as earnest money. For example, many firms do not allow their licensees to accept cash as earnest money. If the broker's trust account is interest-bearing, the broker shall obtain written agreement of the parties indicating to whom the broker shall pay any interest prior to making deposits in such account. So a trust account can be interest-bearing, but you have to get agreement from the buyer and the seller that acknowledging that the trust account is interest-bearing and who's going to get the interest. Hmm, most likely the broker. Now just a note for you to keep in mind, it is very important for you as a licensee to really consider using either the GAR, the Georgia Association of Realtor Contract Forms, or the RE forms. Those forms have been written by attorneys here locally in Georgia to protect you, the licensee, and to protect your broker. The other thing to keep in mind as we go through this course, License Law for Agents and Brokers, is to understand that those contracts are written specifically with license law in mind. So as you clearly go through the actual contracts, both contracts, the GAR contracts and the RE forms contracts, you will notice a lot of this verbiage is pre-printed in those forms so as to comply with license law to keep you out of trouble. So it has in there information about if the account is interest-bearing, who gets the interest. And when the buyer and the seller sign those contract forms, they are, you are getting their written agreement, again, to keep you as the licensee accountable to license law and GREC rules to keep you out of trouble. Let's continue on. A broker may maintain their own funds in a designated trust or escrow account only when they're clearly identified as your deposit and only for the following reasons to cover a minimum balance required, to cover any service charges that the bank or the institution may charge if, uh, let's say, an earnest money check from a buyer bounces, uh, sometimes a bank will charge an NSF fee for that, and so a broker is allowed to keep a minimum balance of their own money in there without it being considered commingled to avoid any of those charges. And commissions due to the broker from funds held provided that the accounting system designates them as the brokers and properly accounts for them, and those refunds are removed each month. Only checks payable to the broker may be used to withdraw money designated as the broker's funds. No broker can take any cash withdrawals from any escrow or trust account. In other words, there must be a clear paper trail 
for the Real Estate Commission to be able to follow because you are handling someone else's money. Every broker is required to maintain a trust, every broker required to maintain a trust account shall maintain an accounting system in which each trust deposit is detailed in the following manner. You must include the names of the parties, the amount and date of deposit, identification of the specific property involved, and the amount, payee, and date of each check drawn on the account in connection with that deposit. Licensees may meet the requirements of this or any other commission rule with either a manual or electronic accounting system as long as the efficiency of the firm's business operations dictate. So you don't necessarily have to have some fancy schmancy accounting software package. You can actually have just a ledger, just you know, a ledger that you can get on paper and pen, but it has to follow the actual uh, accounting requirements dictated by the Real Estate Commission as all of these laws dictate. Regarding whether it's manual or electronic, you have to include the components required by law and sound business practices. Whatever form you're keeping track of, it must be readily accessible, and Greg has to be able to understand it. They can't, you have to have it in such a format that anybody can pick it up and take a look at it and understand the money in, the money out, whose money it is, and what property it gets attributed to, and it has to be reasonably available to the Real Estate Commission. A broker who disperses funds from their trust account contrary to the terms of a contract will be considered by the Real Estate Commission to have demonstrated incompetence to act as a real estate broker in such a manner as to safeguard the interest of the public. There's another answer to one of the quiz questions. A broker who disperses funds from a trust account under the following circumstances shall be deemed to have properly fulfilled the broker's duties. And again, just as I mentioned, the, um, the, the contracts that are written and authored by attorneys here in Georgia, both the Georgia Association of, of uh, Real Estate Contracts as well as the RE forms have verbiage in there that specifically comply with license law. That's why they're written as such. For, so, for example, when we're talking about dispersing earnest money, this is the language it is for on Form F20, at least as of the 2015 printing, paragraph B8B, where it talks about the return and disbursement of earnest money, who's entitled to the earnest money, how it can be dispersed by the holder, um, and these are the following methods under which the earnest money can be dispersed as well as an interpleader agreement and a hold harmless agreement. This hold harmless agreement indemnifies and holds harmless against claims and injuries the holder against the disbursement of the earnest money. Again, this is specifically from the GAR contract, and this is from the RE forms contract. It's RE1, Standard Terms, Paragraph 3.46, again, as of uh, November 2015. Again, all of this verbiage where it discusses disbursement of the earnest money, this whole paragraph, all this pre-printed verbiage, and you can read it in whichever contract under which you are, please note that this is written in here to protect you from, uh, uh, to keep you uh, accountable to license law so that you're not violating license law. So here we go. So this is how a holder can disperse earnest money. Upon rejection of an offer, upon withdrawal of an offer not yet accepted, at the closing of a transaction, upon receiving a written agreement signed by all parties having an interest in the funds separate from the contract that directed the broker to hold those funds. All right, let's take a look at this again. So rejection of an offer. That's if you, as a licensee, you get an earnest money check when you're writing an offer, and you and, and the buyer and the seller never go under contract. Then the escrow, then the holder can return the earnest money back to the buyer. If you uh, if you have made the offer, it hasn't been accepted, and the buyer withdraws the offer at closing. That's normal or upon receiving a written agreement. So this is if the holder of the earnest money gets a written agreement signed by all the parties having an interest in the funds, 
That would be specifically the buyer and the seller, or in the case of a lease, a landlord and a tenant. This written agreement has to be separate from the contract that directed the broker to hold those funds. So basically, you guys, what this is referring to is the termination and release agreement, specifically the release portion of the release agreement. So when one party terminates a contract, regarding the earnest money, the holder must receive agreement. They must receive written agreement separate from the contract. So even if a buyer terminates under an allowed for contingency, you still have to have a form signed by the buyer and the seller that specifically states who gets the earnest money. Number five, upon the filing of an interpleaded action, so if there is a dispute over the disbursement of the earnest money, buyer and seller can't agree, the holder has the option of actually interpleading those funds into the court, or if, if it's done that way and the court tells the holder if there's a court order to disperse the funds in a certain manner, or upon a reasonable interpretation of the contract. So the holder of the earnest money, if there's a dispute, in other words, if you cannot get the buyer and the seller to sign the release agreement, one party doesn't agree to the other one, it's not in writing that they agree to who gets the, the funds, regardless if one party has terminated based on an allowed for contingency or by default, the holder of the earnest money is charged with going through the contract and determining the reason that it failed to close, making an interpretation of the contract, and dispersing those funds based on that interpretation. Now, the specific outline and time frame and notifications under which the holder does that is clearly outlined in the contract. A lot of times you'll hear that referred to as the 10-day letter. So if you, if you have a party and they terminate the contract and you cannot get both buyer and seller or landlord and tenant to agree on the disbursement of the security money, whether it be earnest money or security deposit, you must let the holder of the funds know so that they can proceed with the interpretation of the contract and send notice as to how they're going to disperse those funds. A broker shall not disperse trust funds until they have reasonable assurance that the bank has credited those funds to the broker's trust account. In other words, you have to have good funds in the account. So many firms have a policy by which they are, if, if a buyer, let's say a buyer has written a personal check for earnest money, the holder of that does not have to return that earnest money back to the buyer until there is reasonable assurance that those funds have cleared the account. So that's license law, and that is actually pre-printed in both sets of contracts, but please check with your firm's policy. Many, many firms have a specific policy regarding that, such as a 10 banking day hold on personal checks before releasing those funds. When a broker makes a dispersal to which all parties do not expressly agree, the broker must immediately notify all parties in writing of the dispersal. Again, this is clearly outlined in the contract, and that's what I just uh, spoke about, commonly referred to as the 10-day letter, because the GAR contract form specifically dictates that the holder of the earnest money must send their notification and the person not getting the earnest money or security deposit has, has a, a nine days within which to make a, a, a dispute against the holder's decision. A broker who claims any part of the trust funds paid to the broker in connection with a sale or as part of or all their commission shall be deemed by GRET to have complied with the law. So in other words, you go, you, you know, you're holding earnest money, Deal closes, the broker can then take the earnest money, put it into the commission account, and pay the agent commission as long as the sale, the transaction has closed, or the date of the closing specified in the sales agreement, any extensions have passed, the lease possession has been delivered to the tenant, lease purchase, in a lease purchase situation, the sales transaction has closed, or the date of closing specified in the sales agreement, any extensions thereof have passed, or upon receiving a written agreement separate from the contract, signed by all parties having an interest in the transaction who have agreed that the broker is entitled to any commission. All refunds of trust money must be paid by check or credited at the closing of a transaction. Again, you need a paper trail, no cash withdrawals. 
The total of all checks written against each deposit should reflect a zero balance in the trust account relating to the closing of each transaction. In other words, a zero balance should also occur when the broker transfers funds out as their commission. If a licensee who owned a trust account files a bankruptcy petition, such licensee shall immediately notify the Real Estate Commission in writing of filing that commission. Because if you as a licensee, if you, if you declare bankruptcy and you are holding trust money, that trust money cannot be attached as part of the bankruptcy. If a qualifying broker or the firm that a licensee serves as qualifying broker files a bankruptcy petition, such qualifying broker shall immediately notify Greg in writing of the filing of that petition. A licensee who manages rental property, which the licensee owns 100%, must maintain any security deposits in a designated trust account and may not post a bond in lieu of maintaining such deposits in a trust account. We're going to cover this a little more in depth when we get to agents acting as principals, but you can only hold someone else's money, in other words, trust money or security deposit, if you as a licensee own that rental property, the title is 100% in your name. In other words, you cannot hold that property uh, with a spouse who is not licensed, and an LLC of which you are not the 100% sole member cannot hold, you cannot hold security deposits. Again, we'll cover this a little more in depth when we get to the section, Agents Acting as Principals. Each broker is required to maintain a trust account, shall authorize the Real Estate Commission to have that account examined by a duly authorized representative during each renewal period or other such uh, time as for reasonable cause. Again, we're covering the correct rule that we're, we have already addressed the license law. All right, unfair trade practices prohibited in Georgia. Get comfortable, there are 36 of these, and then we're gonna take a break. So hang tight. For the purposes of this section, the term sale, lease, option, exchange shall be used interchangeably, and I'm just going to say transaction. Also, owner, landlord, buyer, tenant, uh, all of those terms, I'm just going to say party, again, in, in light of reducing the text on the slides and to save my voice. Not sure if that's going to happen. We are back to actual Georgia law, unfair trade practices. OCGA 43-40-25B, subparagraph 1. Again, a lot of these are going to be familiar. Uh, there is a lot of overlap because Greg's sole purpose is to protect the public. So some of it was, again, we talked about this under prohibited uh, effects of, on your license. Now we're talking about unfair trade practices. So basically, it is an unfair trade practice um, because of race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, or national origin. Those should sound very familiar to you. So because of those issues, if you refuse to sell after making a bona fide offer or refuse to negotiate for the sale or otherwise making unavailable or denying real estate to any person, discriminating against any person in the terms, conditions, or privileges of the sale of real estate, or in the provision of services or facilities in connection therewith, making printing or publishing or causing to be made printed or published any notice, statement, or advertisement with respect to the sale of real estate that indicates any preference, limitation, or discrimination, or an intention to make any preference, limitation, or discrimination, or D, representing to any person that any real estate is not available for inspection or sale when such real estate is in fact so available. That's like that accents video we saw at the beginning of the class. Or representing explicitly or implicitly that a change has or will may occur in a block neighborhood or area in order to induce or discourage the sale of real estate. Again, these are unfair trade practices if you do these based on race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, or national origin. Another unfair trade practice is to intentionally advertise, have advertising material which is misleading or inaccurate, or which in any way misrepresents any property, terms, values, policies, or services of the business conducted. 
failing to account for and remit any money coming into your possession, which belongs to others, that's what we just got through discussing. It's trust money, escrow money, security deposits, earnest money, so forth and so on. Commingling the money or other property of the licensee's principles with the licensee's own. Let's go back to that one for a minute. Commingling the money or other property of the licensee's principles. Don't get caught, do not break this law by accidentally commingling someone else's money with yours. For example, let's say your firm does not accept cash as earnest money. You're meeting with a buyer and they give you cash, then all of us as earnest money for a contract. Then you remember your firm doesn't allow cash. Well, you cannot then deposit that money into your own account and go get a certified check or write a personal check or get a money order for earnest money. That absolutely is against license law. That is commingling the property of your principal with your money. You cannot do that. If you have a buyer that wants to give you cash for earnest money and your firm does not take cash, and as instructor to student, I highly, highly discourage you from accepting cash uh, because there is no paper trail for it. There's no way of tracking it or tracing it. What you do is you do not take that cash and you do not change the form of it yourself, but you tell your buyer to go to the bank and get certified funds for that cash or go to any firm, any uh, establishment that will give a money order and get a money order for that cash. There are many, many ways where a public person can go change that money, the cash, or something where you will have a paper trail and they get it exchanged into a form that your broker will take, not you, because that would be commingling if you deposit the cash and then you get a money order. All right, back to unfair trade practices. Failing to maintain in a trust account all money received by your broker acting as escrow agent in a transaction unless all parties have an interest in the funds have agreed in writing. Failing to disclose in writing to a principal uh, any of the following. The receipt of a fee, rebate, or other thing of value on expenditures made on behalf of the principal for which the principal is reimbursing the licensee. So again, you guys, take a look at your contracts. They are written specifically with license law and GREC rules in mind to keep you, the licensee, the agent, out of trouble. This is all clearly written out on your commission instructions in both sets of contract forms. If you're giving a fee or a rebate or if you're paying uh, for something, if you're making an expenditure on behalf of a principal you and you're getting reimbursed, all of that is written out on those commission instructions so that you are not accused of any unfair trade practice. The payment to another broker of a commission fee or other thing of value for the referral of the principal for brokerage or relocation services or the receipt of anything of value for the referral or any service or product in a real estate transaction to a principal. A lot of times you will see um, what's called an affiliated business disclosure form. Many, many companies have them and basically this is to comply with license law and to comply with RESPA that anything of value can't be received um, for a, a specific referral of a principal. So, for example, there are, it is common practice for many real estate firms to have a business relationship with other affiliated uh, uh, service providers, such as a lender, such as a closing attorney, such as a home warranty provider, such as a home inspector. There are many companies that will have, let's call it, a preferred vendor list or an affiliated uh, attorney or lender. There are business arrangements between the firm and between these other service providers that the business arrangement exists in and of itself regardless of any specific referral of a buyer or a seller. So these affiliated business arrangement disclosures are disclosing this to the buyer and the seller so that they don't feel pressured or strong-armed into using any one specific service provider simply because 
there is a, a different, another business relationship between the firm and that service provider. Another unfair trade practice is representing or attempting to represent a real estate broker other than the one who's holding your license without the express knowledge and consent of the broker holding that license. Licensees accepting a commission from anyone other than the broker holding your license without consent of that broker. So you can only get paid by the current broker holding your license unless there is a written agreement between your current broker and your former broker agreeing to pay you. It is also an unfair trade practice to act in the dual capacity of agent and undisclosed principal in any transaction. So if you are the principal, if you are involved in the purchasing or selling of real property, whether it be your primary residence or an investment property, you absolutely must disclose that in the contract to the other party because you, as a licensee, have what could potentially be perceived as an unfair advantage by virtue of the training and education and license that you have as a real estate, uh, at, by holding a Georgia real estate license. So you must disclose um, buyer or seller is duly licensed agent in the state of Georgia. It is also an unfair trade practice to guarantee or authorize any person to guarantee future profits which may result from the resale of real property. It's an unfair trade practice to place a sign on any property offering it for sale or rent without the written consent of the owner or the owner's authorized agent. So you have to have the owner or the authorized agent of that owner, you have to have it in writing their permission for you to advertise their property for sale or for rent. So if you'll notice IDX reciprocity, that's why that is in place, because you get the written consent of the other company, so the authorized agent would be the broker with whom the seller, let's say, has signed a listing agreement. Or if you're going after for sale by owner, you absolutely cannot, it is a license law violation for you to advertise their property for sale without their written consent. So what's one form to get their written consent? How about authorization to show unlisted property? That would be one form where you get their permission to market their property for sale. Additionally, it's an unfair trade practice if you don't remove any sign from the yard 10 days after the expiration of the listing. It's an unfair trade practice if you offer real estate for sale or lease without the consent of the owner or owner's authorized agent or on the terms other than those authorized by the owner or the authorized agent. So in other words, you can't say a property is for sale for X amount of dollars when they have a listing agreement or they have given permission for Y amount of dollars. It's an unfair trade practice to induce any party to an existing contract or brokerage agreement or to break such contract or brokerage agreement for the purpose of substituting another contract agreement with another principal. For example, you cannot tell a buyer, um, hey, you know, if a buyer tells you, if you have a property for sale and a buyer has a brokerage engagement with another brokerage or another agent, you can't induce them to break their existing agreement. You can't say, hey, if you terminate that buyer brokerage agreement and just buy the property without another agent involved, I can get you another deal because I can make a deal on commission. That is absolutely a license law violation. It's another unfair trade practice to negotiate a sale directly with a party if, the, if you as the licensee know that a party has a written outstanding contract in connection with such property, granting an exclusive agency or an exclusive right to sell with another broker. So you can't sell directly with that party if you know they have a listing agreement or they have an outstanding exclusive uh, brokerage agreement with another broker unless the outstanding listing or brokerage agreement provides that the licensee holding the agreement will not provide negotiation services to that client. So if you go back and really take a close look at the listing agreement, you will see that there is now a checkbox in there where it says that you as the uh, listing agent, you will or will not assist the seller in negotiating a contract. That is in there to comply with license law. 
It's also an unfair trade practice if you indicate that an opinion given to a potential party regarding a property is, uh, the price, is an appraisal unless you actually hold an appraiser's license. So you can say it is your opinion. It is a market analysis. And you'll see terms like that. BPO stands for broker's price, broker price opinion. CMA, comparative or competitive market analysis. You can use those terms, but you cannot, te you cannot tell the public that a price uh, estimate for a property is an appraisal unless, of course, you are specifically an appraiser. It is also an unfair trade practice if you perform or attempt to perform any of the acts of a licensee on a property located in another state if you don't have a license in that state. So just because you're licensed in Georgia does not mean you can practice real estate in Alabama, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, Florida. You have to have a real estate license from that state in order to practice real estate in that state. When can a broker pay a commission for performing real estate services to someone who is not licensed? Again, this was a quiz question, remember? To an estate or heirs of a deceased real estate licensee when such deceased licensee has a valid Georgia real estate license in effect at the time when the commission was earned and at the time of the person's death. So for example, there's a real estate licensee who uh, negotiated a contract got a property under contract, and they passed away. The broker, once that property closes, the broker can pay that licensee's heirs or estate the commission. Obviously, that uh, heir or estate may not have a real estate license, but the, the deceased licensee did earn that commission. Or B, to a citizen of another country acting as a referral agent, if that country doesn't have real estate brokers, and if the Georgia licensee paying such commission obtains reasonable written evidence that the payee is a citizen of another country and is in the business of brokering real estate in that other country. So basically, you can deal internationally and a broker can pay a real estate commission uh, to another, uh, uh, to a person in, in another country if their way of, com of conducting real estate is different from ours. And C, by the brokerage firm holding a licensee's license to an unlicensed firm in which the individual licensee owns more than a 20% interest, provided that one, such individual earned it on behalf of the firm, two, such firm does not perform real estate brokerage activity, three, the affiliated licensee and the brokerage firm have a written agreement authorizing the payment to the unlicensed firm, and four, the broker obtains written evidence that the affiliated licensee owns more than a 20% interest in the firm being paid. All right, let's continue on. It is another unfair trade practice if you fail to include a fixed date of expiration in your written listing agreement, and if you fail to leave a copy of the agreement with the principal. Also unfair if you fail to deliver within a reasonable uh, a reasonable time, a completed copy of any contract or offer to the purchaser and to the seller. Basically, anything the public signs, they absolutely must have a copy of that. Now, it can be an electronic copy if you're doing e-signatures, or it can be a uh, paper copy, but they must have a copy of any and everything they sign. It's another unfair trade practice, failure by a broker to deliver to the seller in every transaction at the time of the transaction is closed, a complete and detailed closing statement showing all of the receipts and disbursements handled by the broker for the seller. And to the buyer, a complete statement showing all money received in said transaction from the buyer and how and for what the same was dispersed. The broker shall retain true copies of such statements in the broker's files. It's an unfair trade practice to make any substantial mis misrepresentations. It's unfair to act for more than one party in a transaction without the express written consent of all parties in the transaction. Again, take a close look at your contracts, you guys. You will see all of this verbiage pre-printed, not only in your purchase and sale agreements, but in the listing agreements and in your buyer brokerage agreements. Failing, acting for more than one party in a transaction without the express written consent. So again, 
All of this is dual agency is disclosed as well as the actual agency relationship. You will see that on every purchase and sale agreement. That's why it's there. It is another unfair trade practice for failure of a licensee to place, there we go again, as soon as soon after receipt as is practically possible in the custody of the broker, any funds entrusted to that licensee by any person dealing with the licensee as a representative of that licensed broker. Again, that's earnest money, that is retainer fees, that is security deposits, so forth and so on. If it is money that belongs to someone else that a public person gives to you as a licensee for, with respect to that, uh, that real estate transaction, you have to place it into the custody of the broker as soon as practically possible. It's another unfair trade practice to file a listing contract or any document or instrument purporting to create a lien based on a listing contract for the purpose of casting a cloud on title to the real estate when no valid claim under said listing contract exists. It is also an unfair trade practice and if you're ha uh, having demonstrated incompetency to act as a real estate licensee in such a manner as to safeguard the interest of the public, or having demonstrated any other conduct which constitutes dishonest dealing. So dishonest dealing, that one should be pretty self-evident to you. Demonstrated incompetency, incompetency to act as a real estate licensee in such manner as to safeguard the interest of the public. This you really need to pay attention to. What this is referring to is it is an unfair trade practice for example, for you to potentially interact with the public, let's say in a commercial real estate transaction, when you are incompetent to handle such a type of transaction. If you do not have any training, any competency, any previous experience in dealing with a commercial real estate transaction, then how can you demonstrate competence in, deal, in doing a new transaction in that venue? For example, another example would be if you have never written up a lease on behalf of someone, if you have no education on leases or property management or anything like that, then you cannot engage necessarily in that practice. You could be held uh, responsible. You could have violated Georgia License Law 43-40-25B subparagraph 25. You could be... Uh, doing an unfair, unfairly trade practice by demonstrating incompetency. Just because you have a real estate license and residential resale, you have to be able to demonstrate that you have knowledge and experience in conducting other type of transactions for real property in the state of Georgia. Another unfair trade practice, obtaining a brokerage agreement or contract from a party while knowing or having reason to believe that another broker has an exclusive agreement with such a party unless a licensee has written permissions from the broker having the first exclusive brokerage agreement. And it's an unfair trade practice. You have to keep three years true and correct copies of all your sales contracts, closing statements, any offer or other document that resulted in the depositing of trust funds, accounting records related to the maintenance of any trust account required by this chapter. So check with your own firm. Hopefully your brokerage has some sort of method for maintaining their copies of the transactions, because brokers also have to maintain these uh, copies of these contracts for three years. But you as a licensee, you too are charged with keeping copies of all of your contracts, settlement statements, and any document that has resulted in any type of escrow money or any type of trust account. Three years you have to maintain. And any other document relating to the real estate closing or transaction or failing to produce such documents at the reasonable request of the Real Estate Commission or any of its agents for their inspection. Also unfair if you are a party to any falsification of any portion of any contract or other document involved in any real estate transaction. Failing to obtain the written agreement of the parties indicating to whom the broker shall pay any interest earned on trust funds deposited into an interest-bearing checking account prior to depositing those funds. This should sound familiar. This is also pre-printed in your real estate contract. Also unfair to fail to disclose in a timely manner to all parties in a transaction 
any agency relationship that the licensee may have with any of the parties. Again, you will see that agency disclosure on your purchase and sale agreement in the RE forms contract as well as the GAR forms contract for this specific reason so that you, the licensee, can comply with license law. It's also an unfair trade practice if you induce any person to alter, modify, or change another licensee's fee or commission for real estate brokerage services without that licensee's prior written consent. This practice, unfortunately, was fairly rampant during the huge run-up of short sale contracts. When there was a short sale contract and uh, the listing agent was working with the seller who was working with their lender on a short sale to accept a short sale, and the short sale lender would come back and say, I'll accept the deal, but I'm not paying uh, X amount of commission. I'm only going to pay Y amount of commission. Technically, according to license law, the listing agent should have been the only one to take that hit or that decrease on commission if they did not have the buyer's brokerage, the buyer's broker's agreement to take a reduction or change in commission. They can't automatically, if a short sale lender uh, altered the commission, that doesn't automatically alter a buyer's broker's commission without their written consent. And last one, failing to obtain a person's written authorization to refer that person to another broker for real estate services and failure to disclose any compensation on such referral. So let's talk about this for one second. As a licensee, I think you're fairly familiar with if you're going to refer someone either as a buyer or a seller to another brokerage, whether it be across town or in another state, I think you're fairly familiar with filling out a broker-to-broker -broker referral so that you uh, work out in advance what percentage fee you are going to get paid for sending that referral to another broker. That's pretty common. The issue is it is an unfair trade practice and a violation of license law if you do not also get the person whom you are referring, you have to get their written authorization to be referred. In other words, if you are going to make money by giving a name and contact information to another broker who's then going to help them buy or sell real estate, if you're going to make money off of sharing that information, you have to get that person's permission. So how do you do that? Again, we've got a GREC for, uh, form for that. So here's the GAR broker-to-broker -broker referral agreement. You're used to seeing that. And here is the GAR referral authorization. This is what you have to get, the signature of the person being referred. You have to get their signature and the date. That's the GAR one. Here is the RE Forms one. This is the broker-to-broker -broker referral agreement in the RE Forms. And here is the, wrong one. Here is the prospect's acknowledgement and consent to be referred. Again, this is the RE Forms version. So that is, you have to get those signed or it is considered an unfair trade practice and a violation of license law. For property management and community association management, I'm not going to cover that in this presentation, but you do have a handout that covers the license law affecting those. All right, thank you so much. Hang tight and go take a break.